Welcome to the uh, polysulfones lecture for thermoplastic resins. Once again, we are doing sulfur and oxygen containing thermoplastics. Last time we talked about polyphenylene sulfide and this time we are talking about polysulfones. So here's our friend polyphenylene sulfide. Here's a polysulfone. They both have sulf in the name, but they are different. Polyphenylene sulfide has a sulfur in the uh, backbone. This has a sulfone in the background, backbone. Well, what's the difference? They both have a sulfur. Ah, uh, yes, this is a sulfur that is uh, bound to other carbons. This is a sulfone, which is bound to two other carbons and two oxygens. That's the, what, that's the group you're looking for in the backbone of a polysulfone. So make sure you know the difference between a polysulfide and polysulfone. Also, one of the differences is polyphenylene sulfide is uh, semi-crystalline. Polysulfones are amorphous and high temperature engineering thermoplastics. These can cost a lot more than polyphenylene sulfide, $350 to $5 a pound. So we're actually, based on the price, getting a little bit up into the specialty, but they still produce the engineering thermoplastic type properties. There are five major types of polysulfones. Uh, there's the union carbide ones that are polyaryl sulfones, so udel and radel, and then there's the polyether sulfones, the vitrex, and the polyaryl ether sulfones, the astral. Uh, so this is a family, whereas the polyphenylene sulfide is just one structure. So there are many different kinds of polysulfones. Please excuse the high quality of this graphic, but it's really the only one I could find that showed all of these together. So this is the uh, Udel type, uh, this is the Astral type, uh, this is the Victrex, and then uh, this is the Raydel type uh, of the polysulfones. Once again, all of them have these sulfone groups in the backbone, and that's how you can tell that they're polysulfones. Polysulfones are made by two different routes for uh, polymerization. There's polysulfonylation and polyetherification, and that kind of depends on whether or not you have an ether type thing, but polysulfonylation and polyetherification are the two major routes. This is polysulfonylation. Uh, you, this is a friedel crafts type reaction for those of you who are big old chemistry nerds. But uh, it, this is, produces the astral type of polysulfone. So you start off with these uh, chloride uh, uh, monomers, and then this produces this particular polymer. The copolymer has repeat units with uh, ratios of 60 to 40 of this monomer to that monomer, or 70 to 30 this monomer to that monomer. Uh, the reason is, is, this, is uh, this monomer has an oxygen in the backbone, uh, and that oxygen gives it some flexibility, which is positive, but if you have too much of that monomer, it'll be a little too flexible, and that can compromise the thermal properties. This is the polyetherification process. So this produces the Udel type of polysulfone. So once again, I know this is kind of grainy, but this is the best picture that I could actually get of this whole process. So here we have bisphenol A. Bisphenol A rears its ugly head again. And then you react that with 4 4 prime dichloro uh, diphenyl sulfone in the presence of sodium hydroxide to get this particular type. Uh, it takes place in a highly polar solvent, so uh, DMSO or dimethyl sulfoxide or sulfonylane, both of which are really expensive solvents. The properties of polysulfone is that it has no crystallinity, 0% crystallinity, 100% amorphous. Its TG is very high for being 100% amorphous, 190 to 250 Celsius. It has high strength, both tensile and flexural, and its tensile modulus is also very high. This has very good dimensional stability as well. It has very good heat resistance. Its critical use temperature uh, is up to 240 Celsius. Its heat deflection temperature is up to 260 Celsius. This meets the FAA requirements for being self-extinguishing. Uh, it must, the FAA requirements are that oxygen index must be 28 or above. That's, where, that's why that keeps showing up in my tables. Um, for something to the, for, uh, the purposes of this, I always ask that it be 21 or 22, but for the FAA requires 28 or above. And the oxygen index of uh, polysulfones range from 32 to 36, depending on the specific monomers that are used to make the polymer. This has very good resistance to acid and alkali, however, it is susceptible to esters, ketones, and halogenated and aromatic hydrocarbons. It can be machined by conventional methods, laser or water jet. It has very good electrical insulating properties, again, only if you need it for the properties that it has, aside from its electrical insulating properties. 
It has good moisture absorptivity, but it does require drying before processing. There's some oxygen, uh, there's a lot of oxygens and sulfurs in there, and they tend to uh, 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 attract moisture. This does uh, yellow with outdoor exposure, uh, so it does not have very good UV light susceptibility. It also has poor environmental stress cracking resistance. So that's where polyphenylene sulfide has an advantage over both of these. Uh, it is susceptible to solvent attack, especially halogenated and aromatic hydrocarbons, and it has a high processing temperature. It has a high TG. Above TG, you get chain movement, and if chains can move, then they can melt and flow. Uh, but below the TG, everything is just glassy and solid and nothing's happening. So you have to get this pretty hot in your processing to get that flow to happen. And that's because the, these chains are very, very stiff. You see a lot of aromatic rings in the backbone, and that uh, contributes to chain stiffness. So your processing temperatures are typically above 300 Celsius. That's a lot of energy to put in uh, in order to get something to melt. So if you don't need polycell phones, once again, you probably won't be using them. Plum, this is often used in plumbing parts, so uh, hot water pipes or shower heads. It's used in dishwasher impellers appliance housings, uh, and microwave oven windows. Uh, that's because it's amorphous. Uh, this is what your window, so to speak, is on your microwave. They don't make microwave oven cookware very much anymore, uh, but, they, but they used to make it out of polycell foam. Uh, so yeah, your, your microwave oven does not have a glass window, it is polycell foam, because it's amorphous and you can see through it. So you can watch your hot dog explode as opposed to just live in, live in ignorance of what that boom was. They're also used for distributor caps and battery casings. They're used for electrical insulation in applications that require the high temperature properties, circuit breakers, and connectors and housing. They're also used in sterilizable hospital equipment, but they can also be used in lenses and fiber optic components because they're amorphous and clear. They're also used for aircraft interior components because they meet the FAA requirements for being self-extinguishing. So this one is pretty short. Honestly, the most of the lectures here from here on out are pretty short. But from here, we're going to move on to polyether emits.